In this episode of Mind Pump, we just got voted the number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast in a mm. poll done here at Mind Pump. Thanks, people. Did that poll. <laughs> yeah, number one. Uh, so check this out. This is an episode where we answer people's fitness and health questions. Of course, we're personal trainers with over two decades of experience. We're experts on this kind of stuff. Kind of a big deal. But the way we open the episode is we talk about current events and studies. We have some fun conversation. By the way, if you want to get timestamps of all the stuff we talk about in this episode, fast forward to your favorite part. Go to ma- uh, excuse me, mindpumppodcast.com. But I'm going to tell you right now what happened in this whole episode. So we open up by talking about Dan Bilzerian. Ooh. He's that uh, cool guy that super cool seems to be lying a lot about how much money he's made. He's in hot water right now. It's yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah, yikes. Then we talk about how Facebook is it battling with Australia. I guess Australia is trying to get them to pay people that post on their platform, and Facebook is mm. saying no, we're not going to do that. Uh, let's see what happens. Yeah, good luck with that, Australia. Then we talked about uh, Cobra Kai again. Look, that's a great show. We if can't you, help itself. If you grew up in the 80s and 90s and you're old like we are, mm. watch Cobra Kai. It'll, Sweep the leg. It'll bring all the feels. Then I talked about how Pinterest paid a ton of money to get out of San Francisco. That's bad news. Hmm. We talked about car hop dining. This seems to be coming back in fashion due to COVID. Thanks, COVID. Yeah, we're going back in time. Uh, then I talked about uh, the memes that people are sending us uh, that they make up about us. I can't believe people make memes about us. Yeah, that's weird. That's hilarious. Uh, one of the memes talks about Adam's love of Organifi's green juice. Organifi is a company that makes organic supplements. Uh, protein powders. They have red juices that uh, combine certain compounds that give you energy. They have a green juice that's delicious. It's got green superfoods. You could try that out. They have a gold juice, which is good for relaxation. Go check this company out. One of the better companies out there for organic uh, supplements. Um, And because you listen to Mind Pump, of course, you get a discount. You might turn into a juicer. Just go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash mind pump, and then use the code mind pump for a massive and fat 20% off. Ooh. Then I talked about a study on an old supplement I used to take back when I was like 17 called AKG. Bring it back. Let's see what happens. Then we got into answering the questions. Here's the first one. What's the best way to get rid of a mom pooch or a dad pooch? Dads get them too, but moms have a, a, some special issues. So mm. we talk about how to address the TVA muscles, how to shrink and tighten the waist, During that segment of this episode, I mentioned the Fit Mom Maps Bundle. This is where we combine three maps programs specifically designed to help train a mom uh, after she's had a baby. So after everything's cleared, what you do is you get the bundle, you start with Maps Anywhere, you do Maps Hit, and then you do Maps Anabolic. Boost your metabolism, tighten up the waist, strengthen all the important muscles. You can find that, by the way, at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Yeah, for the moms. The next question, uh, this person says, you know, we've talked about a study before that says that women uh, gain weight, the average woman gains weight eating over 1,800 calories, but technically don't we need more than that just to get our micronutrients? What's the deal? How do we combat that? So we talk all about micronutrients versus macronutrients, calories. What if you only eat a little bit? How do you make up the difference with uh, all those important micronutrients like vitamin D, K, magnesium, and so on. The third question, this person wants to know if they should be manipulating their macros, that's fats, proteins, and carbs, every time they phase into a new workout. So good discussion there. Should you change those things up when the workout changes or keep them the same? Macro madness. And the final question, this one's about breathing mechanics. Is this an important step indicator of back health? How should I breathe? What's the best way to breathe to give me better health? Uh, so we talk all about breathing, and believe it or not, breathing is extremely important, not for the obvious, but even for fitness goals. Breathing is extremely important. Um, look, uh, Adam mentioned another bundle in this episode called the RGB Bundle. This is another bundle. It c- includes three other programs, MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic. That is a great bundle for people who want to do nine months of targeted training. It's a long-term solution. This is our staple bundle. That's going to give you a faster metabolism, build more muscle, burn more body fat, all the guesswork taken out. We have lots of other bundles, okay? You can do individual programs if you just want us to train you for like three months. But if you want to follow our training techniques and programs and you want to do new workouts every few months, check out our bundles. You can find all these programs, research all the bundles, Find the ones that work best for you, your goals, what you want to accomplish, the kind of equipment you have access to. 
Look up all that stuff at mapsfitnessproducts.com. This is the this is the part that is is crazy to me and I and I wonder if we're going to start to see this happen more and more like you know Dan Bilzerian has 32 million you know followers on Instagram and I think the part that I found so crazy about this story was that this is something that we've seen for a long time I know we've talked about it off air and with friends that we live in this really like very fake Mm. Uh, superficial world, S- big old facade. Yeah, and in- and Instagram <clears throat> does a really good job, or people do a really good job on Instagram of promoting themselves and and making it look like they're much more successful than what they really are. And then you see someone like this, who I would argue is probably one of the most famous people on Instagram. Mm-hmm. 32, 32.3 million followers on Instagram. They call him the king of Instagram. They do, mm-hmm. yeah. and. And to come to, and then you get this this whole thing that's ours. So those that aren't following this story right now, uh, Dan Bilzerian's like in hiding that he hasn't no no one's found where he's at right now, and a bunch of people are coming after him for money because supposedly he's been embezzling all kinds of funds. Now the company Ignite that everybody probably thought was doing so well because they're always doing helicopter trips and you know cruises and boats and. Hot chicks, you know, boats and hoes. Yeah, boats and hoes, right? <laughs> you know, you've been watching this on Instagram for the last three years. He started the company in 2018. And the part that I thought was so. Uh, and it makes like way less. 1.7 million. Then and this is, all pu- this is all public, by the way. So there's. 32 million followers. He go, only made 1.7 million. Yeah, go do, your own, go do your own research. You can look when a company is publicly traded like this, it's, it's publicly traded in Canada, it's a penny stock in the United States. You can look at all the financials. They have to disclose any moves that they do. And basically what's going on is that he's been using uh, uh, public money that's been funding this company, Ignite, which he is the owner of, CEO of. So people are buying the stock. They're buying the penny stock. And he's spending that money like crazy. Meanwhile, the income, the revenue is like nothing. It's tiny. The, The company, he's literally living off of... Yeah. Investors giving the money, spending the investors' lifestyle. money, and yeah. I don't know what is more crazy to me. Right, is that you know he's he's spending millions of dollars uh, beyond what the company is making, or that somebody that big, that famous on Instagram, is only able to pull one point seven million. I know, and you know one point seven million dollars uh, for somebody who has thirty two million followers on Instagram is not a lot of money. That's no. that's like on accident. You're not doing well. You're gonna if you don't if you don't make a million dollars, you know thirty million followers. You should be able to make a million dollars on accident. Yeah. You can make that on keychains. And you're selling a marijuana product. Yeah. I mean, come on. I you mean, know, who doesn't want to smoke weed right now? So two things that I think about with this. Right. Number one, um, it's social media allows people the ability, the powerful ability to false advertise themselves. Now, look, we're all, or I should say a lot of people are guilty of this. You might not be Dan Bilzerian with 30 million followers, mm. but let's be honest. You're not posting pictures of yourself in the morning when you look crappy. You're not talking, you're not posting pictures of you and your spouse arguing. Right. Everything is about, I have the great life and everything's yeah. wonderful and look how you know nice I look and blah, blah, blah. And so, but that, but take that times a billion with these influencers, right? Well, well, look who's really profiting off of all that content, right? Instagram. Oh. Yeah, so this goes in perfectly with what I just read about like Facebook and what they're battling right now with Australia. Hmm. So I guess like Australia created like a law that basically was trying to equal it out in terms of, you know, people's putting publishing content that they would get paid in return for a certain amount of content from these juggernaut companies like Facebook and Google basically. Wait, wait, explain that. So basically like the if they were publishing like news stories, who or, Facebook? No, I- individual people. Okay, got you. Right. So like they they would have to end up basically trying to pay out uh, some of these other people's businesses that were producing uh, this type of content. So they basically are now in a, in a position where they're like, your market isn't that big. So basically, all we have to do is is cut you off then from the news. So it's, it's- I mean, you, yeah, explain this. To, okay, so let's pretend I'm a, a, an influencer on Facebook. I have 10 million followers. You're saying that uh, you're 
you're giving the example, and I'm promoting McDonald's. Does it matter what, what example I use? It doesn't matter, yeah. Okay, so I, I promote McDonald's. Yeah. So what are you saying is the issue that F- Facebook is saying what? Well, so basically they just they just wrote a law about uh, uh, any of the content producers – like need to get like some kind of a, a payment for the amount of content okay. they're putting up. So okay, I don't so know if that makes I, sense. I, I pulled up the article. So yeah. it says that, uh, so Facebook has flashed, this is from Yahoo Finance. Facebook has flashed a warning to global regulators by taking a hardball stance against Australia's plan to force it to pay media company for companies for stories. So in other words, the Australian government has drafted legislation to force the U.S. tech giant and Google to compensate publishers for the value their stories generate for the platform. So in other words- yeah. Media companies. In other words, bad. yeah, Facebook is a free platform. You go on there, you publish your content, you get a lot of eyes on you. And so Australia is saying, hey, Facebook, you should be paying these publishers for providing so much value on your platform. Well, that's interesting. Which is weird. Yeah, how are you going to control yeah, it and, gonna, and, and regulate guess, that? Yeah, and in Europe, I guess, uh, has been trying to push this through and have ha, hasn't had any success yeah i'm not a fan of that that's stupid yeah Fa- look here's yeah. the deal you're using facebook to get a million people on your to look at your stuff yeah like, be grateful right <laughs> that, that's what i'm saying <laughs> yeah so what they're trying to do is they're basically trying to control that and say like you know let's say on that like i said this i have 10 million followers yeah. and i post something and about a brand, the, like you, I, I i i talk about my levi's jeans yeah and even though Levi's doesn't have a contract with me or anything like that, that Instagram should then be forced it's, to pay it's, me. Because it's worse I, than that. Let's say you have a bunch of million, you have millions of followers, and you're producing all this content on Facebook. Oh, forget it's a brand. Just put anything. That. Just and, the fact that they're watching. Yeah, me. and now wow. Facebook needs to pay you because you're making such good content on their platform. Oh, that's yeah. silly. That's a yeah. stupid law. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, so okay, so let's go back to Dan Belzerian. Okay, because yeah, so, he's got 32 million followers, so it's, it's substantial. It's false. It's false advertising times a trillion, but let's also take a step back for a second, okay? This is a weird, like, world that we live yes, in right now. Yes, very. Since when does a CEO who's doing drugs and partying all the times, according to his Instagram, with girls and doing all this weird, crazy shit... Since when is it a good idea to invest in that CEO's company? Like, I, if I am, I, if, if Walmart, you know CEO, what? Wait, you know when? When when Robin Hood came on the market and fucking let kids fucking dude, invest. Uh, maybe <laughs> he's cool. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly that's it. Imagine, imagine if the CEO of Apple or Walmart was like posting videos on like boats with chicks and like drugs. Well, and we're like, for Hugh Hefner, yeah, right? Well, I mean. Yeah, I guess, but maybe. Well, the question is that that I mean, I feel like that's kind of where it's heading. It's heading in that direction where more and more people want to see the CEOs. They want to see their lifestyle. Mm. They want to see, and there's young guys that are coming and girls. Not, not a good business plan. There's young. There's <laughs> no. y- There's young entrepreneurs that see this and are playing right into that. Yeah. I mean, we we know lots of people like that that on on Instagram they they put out this, you know, driving the fancy cars, living the lifestyle. Like they they have this really successful business, and everybody believes it. Yeah, you know what's interesting is that it, the truth. Here's the the real truth that the millionaires and billionaires that are actually consistent, solvent, who are going to last long, you know, a long time, they don't really live that kind of a lifestyle all the time. They 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 work hard, of course not. They spend properly, they invest properly, they take you know proper risks. The people who tend to spend like that are the celebrities and stuff you hear about that go bankrupt. You know, when you hear stories about these celebrities, and you're like, "How the hell did Mike Tyson go bankrupt? Wasn't he worth like hundreds of millions of dollars?" Or yeah, it's because of uh, you know stuff like that. And honestly, as an now that I'm older, when I'd see videos and stuff of Dan Bilzerian, do you know what would cross my mind? That he didn't seem very happy. I know oh, he's putting it out like course, he's a super happy guy. Well, did you hear him on Rogan? They, they they got into that a bit. Like he was doing all this crazy stuff just to like feel something. You know, it, it's where it was. He had like triple bypass surgery or something. Like he had like, <laughs> oh dude, God. he had all these heart problems, conditions. Like I don't know the guy. I just felt like he was just so numb to everything. Well, I mean, taking it back to our space, to the fitness space. You know, this is a problem for people with you know who have body image issues or are trying to get in shape and so they go on social media and look at these influencers. I know a lot of these influencers. I also know people in fitness and these people posting pictures of themselves looking shredded and I'm so healthy and I'm so fit. They, they, some of them are some of the most unhealthy people mm. in real life that you'll ever meet. Terrible body image issues, terrible relationships to food, some of them serious eating disorders, a lot of them on anabolic steroids and drugs. And in real life, 
they're not living the life. Well, they the just same, look good in a picture. That's the exact same example. Only instead of money, we're talking about you know looking a certain way. So instead of having insecurities about being rich and famous and having all kinds of money, the insecurity is the way I look. And it's, I mean, I think that's more often the rule. I Pro- think it's probably. Yeah. I think it's very rare. Um, in fact, I feel like very surprised when we meet somebody who has kind of that image on Instagram, and yet they have they they have it all together. That uh, they recognize how they're using the platform. They know that it gets eyes on them. It's smart business for them, but they don't think that way. I don't feel this way. It's not important to me. That's. I mean, in fact, just saying that, I'm like trying to think who do we even know that's King Keto. Oh, a good yeah, example. Yeah, He's yeah. a good He's, example. That is a good he example. Is yeah, because yeah. if you look at his Instagram and stuff, he does a good job with the whole influencer thing, but legit behind the scenes, very smart mm-hmm. business guy. Yeah. And very, 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 savvy. very private with his, sure. his personal life yep. and everything like that. Yeah, shout out to Brent. I really do like Brent. He is, he is, and he does. He plays the. Yeah. The, the Instagram role really, really well, yeah. and he's really not like that. Super in savvy, yeah. yeah. Super business. That's savvy. That's a good guy. example because I'm I, every a lot of Juju Mufu is another guy like that. Mm. Yeah, very smart. Yes, yep, yep, very yeah. savvy. Yes, very conservative with his money. Is done very well for himself. You would have no idea how smart that guy is. He plays. Yeah, this his goofy, goofy content is like all well thought out. Like mm-hmm. he's constantly coming up with just the most ridiculous creative ideas. I don't know how he does. Yeah, it. and here's the other part of this that's an interesting kind of learning lesson is that just because you have a lot of people that look at you because you have a page that attracts a lot of eyes doesn't mean you make a lot of doesn't money doesn't mean you can make a lot of money off of it because if all of your value is in looking at you and that's the thing that you give away there's no other value yeah, how are you getting compensated for yeah that? nobody's going to pay you for anything else it's like that you know if you get the milk for free why would you buy the cow thing that they say or whatever uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's the same thing it's like you, you know you, you've got all these people looking at you because you show your your body or how cool you are or look at my cool cars. Now, why would they pay you for anything? That's all your value. So you've got like, it's like that, what was that one female yeah, influencer? You, you, I was going to say, I was just going to uh, you know, allude to that because you brought that up. I think it was like a year or two ago yeah. when she had like two or three million followers and most of her followers were gained because she's got half naked pictures. And then she tries to launch her own t-shirt line <laughs> and sells like 12 shirts like 12, or yeah. something like that. Oh my God. Yeah. Some, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. It's wild. I mean, that's another one too. I mean, I was, yeah, I was just, just talking to a, you know, a, a friend of mine who was, you know, asking about, you know, he's getting ready to start podcasts and wants to start this business. And, you know, like the kind of go-to move, because again, I think this is like one of the things that everybody shows on Instagram is, uh, you know, apparel. And, you know, he's like, oh, you know, I'm going to make this t-shirt line. I got this logo and all stuff like that. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like there's, there's no money in that. There really is no money in that. You, the size that you have to become to even make that uh, profitable and to pay the people that would have to package it, to ship it, the, you know, the 50% you're paying to have it manufactured and made and screen printed. I mean, it's just, it is a terrible business model, but yet we see on Instagram, all these kids that, you know, have got their own clothing line or their own brand and they're driving these cars and they're, they're putting Mm -hmm. on this. So then you get this whole generation coming up behind them that thinks that this is the model, like get popular on these platforms, get a lot Mm -hmm. of eyes on me, whichever that, whether that be showing my abs because I'm some dude or my or doing you know crazy things on there or if I'm a girl showing some of my body to get all this attention and then I'm gonna start my line I'm gonna start my line or whatever and the the irony of that to me and when I always try and 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 warn you know a young kid that's thinking this way is that you know do you really think like if let's whatever line it is whether it be a clothing line or you're gonna start your own makeup line like do you think of the big brands that do that? And do you really think that you can outcompete those? Like, do you really think that just because you can get popular on Instagram, hmm. that you're going to compete with Ralph Lauren and Tommy Hilfiger and Calvin Klein? And uh, no, dude, like those those are substantial brands with well, a ton of funds behind them, and they have people that are way d- ahead of the fashion and style, yeah, and they, they get it all to the, a science. Well, it's not just that. I think that there's uh, right now we're in a bit of a bubble with social media that people um, they they see this and they think if if I can just become an influencer or gain uh, a lot of uh, attention. That's a uh, a viable business plan. That's the business plan, right? right? right is exactly. to get is to get a lot of eyes on me on a platform, and then that's going to become my business. It's far more complicated than that. What I predict is I predict the I predict the, com- the network marketing of media. Yeah, I predict the complete collapse 
of businesses that are built on helping you become an influencer because that's what you see a lot of. You see a lot of these businesses that are yeah. like, I'll teach you how to build, how to be an influencer. Well, because you actually you make gain money followers. that way. But yes. now you're hustling like your false ideas to all these people that, that just see the facade. That, well, the, the demand is going to be gone soon because people are going to soon start to realize that's not a business plan. Most people don't make any money doing right. it that way. So all these people selling that, like sign up for my course and I'll tell you how to be an influencer and we'll teach you how to use social media to get popular and gain all these followers. That business model is going to collapse. Right now it's already being built upon itself in Ponzi schemes where- I yeah. wonder though when it's going to so, collapse. That was the, did you see, I did a post on that like, uh, I want to say two, three months ago. Do you remember that? I said the five step, five steps to make a million dollars. Yes. Yeah, that's hilarious. You know, yeah. and step one is pretend like you make all this money then step two, sell- Teach all, people how to- Rent a Bentley. Yeah, yeah, sell all the fools that think that you're making millions of dollars on how you can help them make millions of dollars and then that's where you make most of your money. Like, I mean, yeah. that is the model. It's the model. I mean, how many people would probably- Probably pay Dan Bilzerian for like business coaching. <laughs> yeah, no, the worst, right? <laughs> the worst business coach. Right? I mean, I, yeah. if he wanted to go that direction, that, that model's wide open for him. He's got yeah. enough eyes and attention and young kids that think that, you know, that that's a great idea or they want to live the life he's living. You know what he reminds me of? What was the names of the people that did that, that like vacation island that blew up? What was that again? Oh, oh, um, uh, that we had the guy on the show. Yes. Uh, Fire Festival. Yes, thank it you. It reminds that. me of Fire Festival, like hype and yeah, excitement and totally. everybody cool yeah. and then just yeah. rumbles <laughs> pure house of cards hey, hey so adam uh, i've been waiting to ask you i know you said you've watched the first season of cobra kai yeah yeah T- tell me it's not hitting you right in the freaking feels they man. did okay so they did a really good job man i was actually texting my other uh, my other best friend who uh is like he's really good about like recommending shows and we always go back and forth and uh, and, and i told him i said hey you know i was texting him like midway this was a couple nights ago when i first started watching i said this Cobra Kai thing is not as bad as I thought it was going to be, right? And then he sends back to me, goes, "No, he's like, I've been, I have been kind of watching it. It's pretty good." And I'm like, "Yeah, no, it's it's getting me right." So I ended up watching the full season, <clears throat> and I do. I think that uh, there's a lot of things they did well. Now, mind you, I think if you never watch Karate, oh, Kid, it won't be good. It yeah. won't be good. No, no yeah, I agree. No. With but that. if you were at all at all a fan of the show, right? If you were at all a fan of Karate Kid as a kid growing up, you have to appreciate this show because they did a really good job of a a couple things, I thought. One Mm. one of those things was kind of picking up the storyline and they kept a lot of it, real characters. They, mm-hmm. they integrate a lot of the real characters from the original, which you always appreciate when you see like a sequel or a continuation of, of, of a show. So they kept a lot of real characters and they developed the story as if it, how it probably would have played out. That's the part that I liked the best yeah. was that- uh, It's a continuation. You know, I, I like to talk about, um, you know, the things that I think about as a father now of what I want to be very careful of because of my insecurities and the way I grew up, right? I grew up not having as much. I worked really hard to have things. I have things now, and now I have a child. And the the, the natural progression for a lot of people that are not self-aware is to then allow those insecurities to bleed into your child, and that changes their upbringing sure. because you now provide all these things for them, and then the cycle just continues like that. So they did a really good job of showing like the rich, spoiled kid and mm-hmm. how he turns out, and then how he grows to be an adult and all the, the troubles mm-hmm. that can come from that. The poor, the poor, humble kid who comes from nothing and then how he makes it in life and where he's at in his life. And then now their children and the challenges that they face. So I think they did a really good job of showing and depicting that They, that they did, but you could clearly see that the target, so they, they wrote this with the target audience being men in their you know 30s and 40s who yeah. grew up watching Karate Kid. That's really the target because it, there's so many you know, like uh, things that harken back to the oh, original. Yeah, they, ref- they reference the the original every so. time, yeah, and, yeah. and you get the chills because because when you were a kid, you I mean I, I don't know about you guys, but Karate Kid to me was one of the pivotal movies mm-hmm. of my life as a kid. It was yeah. like I watched that. And I, I was told like, everybody I did karate, and I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Just were, because I watched that, so much of it, yeah, you, you know. Yeah, what's up, what's up? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I thought for sure I could like you know slice through blocks of ice. You're that kid, yeah, you're that kid in fifth grade who got his ass kicked because he tried the crane. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah. really, thought, 100%. That, really thought, <laughs> thought that worked. Thought it worked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hollywood's bullshit. Yeah, yeah. By the way, like when you tell your friends you have a girlfriend, but she lives in Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, got yeah. the picture uh, of her. Yeah. It's like an Olin Mills pic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, it's like one of those like <laughs> glamour shots. Yeah, like, glamour shots. But by they, yeah. Deb. dude, just wait till the second dude. season. They, if you like the way it it, it kind of brings you oh, back to the original, bring back the sensei, bro. Stop. I saw episode one. Okay. Yeah, it's the second season, dude. There's so many moments, and it's so cheesy because it's all because I love karate. I mean, Jessica made so much. She makes fun of me because she's like, are you standing up while you're watching? Cause I, you know, <laughs> I'll sit down. There's one yeah, scene. Get him, Jordy. There's one <laughs> scene in particular where I stood up and I was just you like, did not. bro. Okay. You're going to do it. Okay. Yeah. You right. get emotional a little bit. You get uh, the chills. Like, well, oh, Katrina's I, already, I can't talk shit. I did the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Katrina's already making fun of me. Cause yeah. I'm doing like, like there, there's lines, right? There's parts in the movie where I know that they're setting the table to reference the old and I'll be sweep the leg, Johnny. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Dude. I'll, I'll sudden say some shit like that. So, th- I mean, this, this totally goes in hand with the whole franchise of Star Wars. I know you guys are going to you know, strap in. I'm going to talk about Star Wars. But basically, they're going back now. They, they've given responsibility to Lucas. They've given responsibility to John Favreau because of what they did with The Mandalorian. But where they screwed up with this whole thing is they didn't have that feel. They took, they removed a lot of the essential characters that drove the story mm. and they tried to create something entirely new and that's why it didn't do so well. It didn't include all, like that kind of fandom uh, like you see in, in The Karate Kid. Like Dude. it has, they, they nailed it, you know, and, and they just missed that. I, well, don't you feel like that's, that's really a hit or miss move? It is. It, it's really, it's, 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 a, it's a very hit or miss. Like I think you're better off. I mean, I think the, uh, and, and so I understand why they went the other way. I think you're always better off trying to, write something that is so For the good. original fans. Well, no, no, no. That's no. what I think. No, I don't think you that. You disagree? I disagree. I think that a, a smarter strategy business-wise is to write something that you hope that even a new audience will come on because they'll yeah. like it and hopefully at But least- it has to be a new story though. Right, so, right. So, so the the problem is the disconnect between writing something that's like very almost identical, but with all new characters. Like that just doesn't work. So that yeah. this is why I disagree with what you said, Adam. Because that is hard to try. Because here's the deal: the new one is always going to be compared to the old one. Which here's the problem: if you have an old iconic movie, it's decades old. Star Wars is one of them. You know, Karate Kid, Rocky, The Godfather, whatever. These iconic movies, you will never match uh you'll never be able to compete with them even if you make an awesome amazing movie the memories are always going to be stronger yeah but you're 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 referring to the people that were original fans in fact and here's how i'll I'll, you'll prove this okay so hitmakers is a great book it goes into this and it's really talks about uh music movies and the formula of it in fact we're we're victims of all of this like uh, your, your total recalls movies that we we talk about that were amazing are remakes of other movies Mm-hmm. And so the, it's the formula that they're trying to recreate. Carrying on the story, I think, is more challenging because then you have to appease the old fans yeah. to even get them to, and hopefully, hopefully they still are into that, whatever genre it is or story it is. So you have to really appease them. And then you're hoping that a new audience will be able to pick up where this is left off well, and then get into it, where you're better off. Telling a whole new story with the same formula. Well, That's, so so right. here's so here's a good here's what I mean by that. So with with Star Wars, for example, the dads and moms who are growing up with it and loved it are going to bring their kids to it. They're going to have their kids come to the movie. But you need to do enough in that new movie to throw back to the old one to give you the chills. Again, like you you're, did when you're you were speaking kid. from your perspective. You're, you, it's not. That's not true. Really? I mean, because okay, look, you could have an here's, old. Here's, here's a, look. You have an old rock band from the '80s. They want to do another tour. Make new music or play to the old audience and charge them a lot of money for the tickets and play all the old favorites. You know, karate. This Cobra Kai. Imagine if they made a new Karate Kid. Which well, you they saw tried. that with Queen, right? Yeah, they tried doing that with uh, uh, with the, another Karate Kid, the one with Will Smith. Okay, yeah, it's cool, good movie. Not great. Cobra Kai, way less production value. If I didn't watch Karate Kid, I'd look at it and be like, this is kind of silly. The karate's not even that good. You could tell the actors don't actually do martial arts. That's again, but I love it. That's again, I think that's because they did a really good job of hitting it out the park. It's it's, it's r- more risky that way because yeah. you have to appeal to you in addition, tell a good story. The people that are all watching Cobra Kai right now are not all us. We are the, we are definitely we're, we're we, the ones driving it. I guarantee. M- maybe you. okay, fair enough. But that's just it. It had to hit there to get us to drive it, and then it had to be good enough to appeal to another audience. That's hard to do while staying on the same exact storyline. That's what they did such a good job. Well, I'll get. Look, so, I'll, I'll uh, tell you what. When they when they make like Predator or Conan, I would love it if Arnold somehow 
is in there as like an old, like, you know, oh, we got to go talk to the guy who dealt with Predator originally and have Arnold. Right. Just a small thing like that would make me go, oh, oh yeah. That'd hell be awesome. yeah. You know, something like well, that. Well, they try right? that in Terminator. That's why he's always showing up. And that's why I would watch it. You yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> the only reason. Just, just for Arnold. Yeah. But, but yeah. I, I get what you're saying. Too, well, yeah. No, the, the Hitmakers gets into all this. So, I mean, it's a yeah. great book if you want to read all that. I think Derek Thompson's the author and it, it talks about all this. Mm. It's not, uh, it's not that easy to do that. That's the challenge. Sure, the challenge sure. is to be able to appeal. And because here's the reality, too. We were uh, you know, young kids at that time in our life where a, a big part of our life was play and watching movies. That's a majority of our life. A lot of us have grown up and don't have time to go back and watch Cobra Kai. There's a, there's a massive core audience that watch Karate Kids that are not watching Cobra Kai right now. So you are relying on you're going to get a, a good portion of those people, hopefully to be your base, and then in addition to that attract a whole new audience based off of the successful formula that you played in the first one. So, referring back and playing off the the original is much more difficult, and that's the reason why companies like Star Wars did was try and tell a whole new story in hopes that it's so good that we yeah. create a well, whole new in hopes you get the the new base. Yes, right? a new to, a new base, a new generation who doesn't feel left out when they're watching it. That don't watch and go like I don't get any of these fucking references cuz I wasn't born well, in the 80s. Yeah, maybe for Star Wars, right? Cuz they want to continue on this this crazy franchise. I don't think Cobra Kai is trying to continue on this crazy franchise. I think they're trying to do these series on YouTube and yeah. you know on Netflix maybe it's a little bit different it, it was definitely the writing though you know yeah. the, the writing is, was good it, that, and that means a lot more you know than all the different like effects and all this kind of like background stuff that a lot of producers and movie directors yeah. think is going to like sell the movie it's right. like you got to have a good story you yeah. got to write it I mean, out and I mean but how many how many of your friends did you kick in the face because of that movie though <laughs> I, I, I me and my cousin my cousin yeah, dude I was breaking boards and shit like, dude, yeah. my cousins and I like this we used to get in fights a lot anyway there was nine boys so like fist fights is what we did all the time yeah when we watched karate kid it was a royal rumble yeah karate all chops the time. don't work by the way yeah. <laughs> no who, who does that hurts your fingers yeah it's horrible I, I feel like if you did though and everybody saw you do that well yeah you're yeah. a badass yeah you're, you're gonna strike yeah. fear hey yeah. did you guys see what's ha what happened with pinterest in san francisco no no okay are so are they leaving so you guys know pinterest that wouldn't uh, surprise me. yeah the big company pinterest right yeah they just paid something like eighty million dollars to break eighty nine million dollars. Oh, to break a lease. To break I their did, lease. I did hear this. To leave San Francisco. What? It's a four hundred ninety squ uh, thousand square foot uh, office space. Eighty nine million. They How paid, much are they even worth? They paid eighty nine million to leave yeah. just to break the lease. That's insane. San right now, San Francisco is bleeding. Uh, they did this anonymous survey of forty four hundred tech workers. Two thirds. So a vast majority of them said that they would leave the region permanently if they were allowed to work from home. And something like 50% of storefronts in San Francisco are closed wow. right now. Is The same thing's happening in L.A. too, right? I hear L.A.'s got a mass exodus yeah. right now. All too. the big cities. Yeah. All the big cities Why right now. Why not us? What do you mean? Why not us then? San we're Jose? Not, yeah, we're not seeing a mass exodus. We, I we're seeing the opposite. Uh, dude. Our house doesn't stay on the market longer than seven days uh, here right in now. terms of the housing. Yeah. We're start. You know why we are seeing uh, an exodus? Not like San Francisco, but San Jose is still considered a suburb if you look at it in comparison to San Francisco. We may get people from San Francisco. Yeah, we're still a commuter city to San Francisco. Yeah, right? but I but you were bleeding too. If you look at the amount of people leaving um, San Jose, there's, what, what, there's quite a bit. Are we? Yeah, Gavin Newsom is, is handsome. I so. stupid. <laughs> you know, like he's got that going. For Dude, him. you guys see what Nancy Pelosi got in trouble doing? Did you oh, see for video? The, the, yeah, no mask and going to the hair salon. She or went inside a hair salon, got yeah. her hair done, no <laughs> mask. <laughs> wow, so, so stupid. That's a bad, How dare you? Bad politics, How right there, bro. I'm Pelosi. so, I am so over politics right now. I, I, can't, I wish it would. Me too. We could hurry up and get to this fucking election so we can drop. I don't want to hear any more of anybody's ideas. I'm, I'm so, I'm I so saw, tired. I of saw it. a bumper sticker that said, um, you know, it said uh, it was, it was, it was like one of those bumper stickers that tells you to vote for a candidate. Yeah, and it was like vote for Meteor 2020. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I posted one. Somebody sent me about like that guy, like Jack or whatever. Like he's he, he promotes cheese, and I was like, he's got my vote. Yeah. Oh yeah, I saw that one. Yeah. Did you see the uh, the stimulus package thing that the UK did to try and uh, re-stimulate the economy with like eating out or whatever? No, I thought that was interesting, uh, and, and it's hard to say how successful it will be. I know they had a huge amount of people that use it. I think it was like uh, you know they have sixty four million people or something, and, and like sixty three million dollars was spent. 
Uh, so the idea was, I mean, one of the the bleeding industries right now is uh, restaurants. Is uh, big rest- time. Yeah, the just dining out and employees that work for that. So that's a, that's a huge part of our economy, their economy that's that's being hurt. And so the, the government came out with this idea of uh, thirteen dollar vouchers. So like everybody got thirteen dollar vouchers to eat to dine out to try and re-stimulate people really? going back out. And so, <laughs> so $13. Well, yeah. well, that's the idea yeah. is that you 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 give everyone a little bit of money. Get you get some breadsticks. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Do you, you know what that is, by the way? This what? is what people need to realize. Okay, when the government gives you money, they don't have money to give you. They <laughs> you <come> <laughs> so what they did essentially it's is- backdoor they, you. They took your money. They Dan Bilzerian to you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's exactly what happened. They oh, took man. They took your money and gave it back to you and said, here's your $13, but you can only spend it here. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. And everybody's like, "Yay! Oh my you God. guys are so nice for doing that to me." Well, I think that's I think that's the the argument right now is like, did it really do anything? You know, yeah. so yeah, all of a sudden, sixty four million dollars was spent out there, but then it cost X amount of dollars just to get that. Well, what's actually interesting is how some of these other companies have pivoted. Like, so they've actually resurrected the car hop uh, dining experience. Oh yeah, yeah, which makes a, a whole lot of sense. I was like, wow, that's that's a brilliant. That was a big thing in the in the fifties mm-hmm. and sixties. Started right? in San Francisco, yeah, Mel diner i believe so yeah there's a few of these old diners that are now like converting it to have the roller skates and all that kind of stuff and basically come up to your uh, car door and serve you food wow that's awesome those are the stories i like to hear i love to hear the companies right now that are figuring that, it out yeah f- pivoting getting creative and finding a way out and there, there is i mean you're, there's still a lot of companies that are having success yeah, yeah i went to go eat dinner last night in santana row and one of the sides of the lanes has now been converted to outdoor seating for yeah. all the restaurants so. that's kind of like the standard now like truckies downtown is like that i know that even yeah. willow Glen's getting that build way platforms over their parking lot mm-hmm. yeah yeah well that's 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 all good stuff i guess um dude uh you know what i love seeing by the way so you guys you know you guys know how people send me memes all the time of course lately i've been getting people sending me memes about us oh yeah <laughs> mind mind pump memes uh and, someone started and, an instagram page I I there's several those. of them yeah and they'll send they'll say something about like justin or yeah. cheese and me about you know yeah. let me tell you something more i got a conspiracy one of me uh they, recently they did yeah, it's a, it let great. me tell you something it's yeah. a pizza gate yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah they had one about adam and, and uh, organified green juice it said something like i don't drink water i just drink organified oh green yeah, juice yeah or i saw like that, that. Yeah. hey speaking of organified did how did you guys like the uh, pineapple smoothie that jerry made for us the other day really good now that one was delicious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a, their the recipes are are uh, totally underplayed. If you you want to make yourself like like tasty high protein or you know healthier you know tasting snacks or snacks that are healthy, I should say, they have so many recipes on there that you can use some of their products to make, and they're legit. They're like, actually. The, pretty you, good. you see the recipe on that? It's like not. It's almond milk, the vanilla whey protein, and some chops well, of vegan protein. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. The vanilla. The flavor. You said way. Yeah. Oh, did I say way? Yeah, you did. Oh, yes. vanilla, vanilla, vanilla protein powder with some pineapple chunks. I think if I, w- I think adding either a banana or like I think D- Doug referenced ha- adding like coconut would be some bomb. whiskey. Yeah, mm. but blend that on yeah. some ice. Definitely really, whiskey. really, really good. I wonder if anyone's ever done that, like uh, a meathead. You know, has had a party. Of course, Dude, and he's I did that. Said, no, you did. <laughs> of bro. course, I did. Well, I'm gonna drink on. at least. I'm gonna get my protein. Oh, hold on a second. Of course, we did. You made you made mixed drinks at a party, and in the mixed drinks you put protein, like, yeah. amino acids, of, and protein. No, not amino acids, but we did protein shakes and then add like rum and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that exact wow. drink would actually go great with some rum in there. It tastes like a pina colada. Oh my god, dude! I can see those pink amino acid drinks, and they're putting vodka in it. No, we see, totally like, did shit like that. Yeah. Little skinny, oh, yeah. skinny teens. You guys didn't do that. Right? So we also used to take like speed stacks and then do that as like either a chaser or or just oh my God. or speed just straight well, speed, speed stack with vodka. But a speed like, stack with vodka, but on steroids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, a speed stack though was like that's like that's not healthy. It's to hype you up. Well, I you know, know protein but, is like you know what? Well, oh, I get that's smashed. That's a horrible yeah, idea. May as well get my protein. I got to make sure I don't lose any muscles. Yeah, one hundred percent. I thought like that. Let me have some amino acids. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of amino acids, so. There, because I've been in the space for so long, I see supplements going out of favor, coming back in favor, going like the same supplements over and over again. Yeah. But there's some supplements that disappear, never come back. And then every once in a while, a study will come out to say that that supplement has a lot of value. So there's a supplement about to make a huge resurgence. Oh, really? No affiliation. So we don't don't work with any companies that sell a supplement. But when I was a kid... There was a supplement called AKG, uh, alpha ketoglutarate, I think it was called, and it was for muscle recovery. It was a bodybuilding supplement. You're supposed to take it post-workout, and it was a big 
Uh, it, it was super popular back in the, I want to say 90s maybe, and then it disappeared. Well, a study comes out that they, they gave this to rats, tested it against water, and it had tremendous anti-aging effects on the rats. What's that mean? Mm. Tremendous. It like they had shinier splinter. Yeah, they had shinier coats, they they had better muscle strength and performance, and they all they had signs that they were all younger and healthier compared to the other rats from <laughs> from AKG. This is a supplement I what, took when I was like der- 17. What's it derived from? What's it come from? I have know? no idea. You have no idea? I forgot. It's the fountain of youth. It's like what? I think it's a byproduct of an amino acid of some sort and it declines as you age or whatever. That's the whole thing, but so it's going to fall in like that whole collagen push, right? Uh maybe, but uh I got to look deeper in the study. I think the rats took a shit ton of it, so I don't know if it's realistic, uh, you know, for people. Just get so, injected. Yeah, you get inject your AKG, but yeah. old supplement. Let's see what I guarantee the supplement makers are going to start marketing that again because I know it's cheap. That'll be interesting. Keep your eyes open. Mm. First question is from Katie Conton. What's the best way to get rid of a mom pooch? Everything else has returned, but the midsection. Oh yeah, this can be super frustrating for. Uh-huh. So many names for this, by the way. Yeah, I know, yeah, right? And, and not just, this isn't just a mom thing. Yeah. Well, this, there's there's a couple things. that We called we, it the FUPA. You're, you're right. There's a couple things I want, thanks, uh, Justin. Just, Holy cow. No problem. There's a couple things I want to I want to talk about here with this because if it's ex- excess body fat, you could get leaner. Um, that's the main reason why a lot of people have a pooch. But specifically to moms or to women who just had a baby or can't seem, they get lean. They work their abs, their obliques, they train their body, and even though their body fat percentage is down, they have this kind of lower belly pooch that sticks out a little bit, and they can't figure out why. Very frustrating because they're doing everything they're supposed to. I've trained women in this particular situation, and really, this is the result. If you're lean, and you're fit, and you're working out, and everything else is good, and you still have this, this is because your TVA muscle has not been... Uh, properly strengthened post-pregnancy. So this is a, a muscle. TVA stands for transverse abdominis. And it's a muscle that is it's deep in the core, so it's under the abs and the obliques, and it surrounds the midsection, and it's kind of like a corset or a weight belt. So when you're at the beach and you suck in your stomach, mm. the muscle that sucks in your stomach is your TVA. When you're pregnant, this muscle has to stretch and atrophy to make room for baby. it's This muscle in particular has to stretch and atrophy because it's the one that shrinks your midsection. So when it stretches and atrophies, as the baby grows, then you have the baby, and then it, you know, there, there's nothing in there anymore, there's no more baby in there, but this muscle remains atrophied and, and weak, and so you strengthen your abs, you work out your obliques, you get leaner, but because you didn't strengthen this specific muscle that tightens up and shrinks the waist, the your organs kind of push out a little bit because the midsection's full of organs, right? Push out a little bit. So you get this lower belly pooch. So the solution for this in this particular situation is to do exercises that specifically work the TVA. Mm, One of the them drawing in, in maneuvers. That's it. One of them in particular is called a a, a stomach vacuum. This is an mm-hmm. old school exercise bodybuilders used to do. We actually have a great YouTube video on Mind Pump TV about this specific exercise. So we'll make sure we link it in the show notes where I teach how to do it. But this exercise is great for strengthening that and getting rid of that particular Yeah, also pooch. cat, cow, and, and uh, you know techniques like that. But definitely they all uh, revolve around that drawing in maneuver. We even have this as a component in our prime uh, test, uh, the wall test. And so that's something that you can check whether or not uh, you, know, you have access to that properly where your ribs will then flare out a bit if it's if it's not uh, contracting properly so that's something to consider too in terms of your overall bracing when you get back into weightlifting you want to be able to have that uh, reestablished so you're uh, you know stabilizing everything correctly so I agree with you guys but I don't think this is the only thing going on here um, and this, I, I didn't realize this until it happened to me. So that's why I made the statement that this oh, isn't just- You got is, the dad pooch? Yeah. Like a, <laughs> so Dad uh, bumper. And, and I know there's going to be a ton of people that relate to this because after this happened to me, and then I, I've spoken about this before in the podcast a long time ago, and I, I've had tons of DMs in regards to it after I, I talked about it. And I remember when I was getting ready, before I was going to actually get on stage, I, I had the first year of like, I, I told myself, okay, if, I, if I'm going to do this thing where I'm going to compete and get on stage, I'm going to do a year of training and dieting 
uh, without a show in mind, right? Which is what I recommend to most people. So before you decide you're going to sign up for a show and just compete, why not? you know, run a dry run of pretending like you're going to get ready for stage so you can get a feel of what it's going to be like. So I did that the year leading up into competing. And uh, up until that point, I had never pushed myself below 7% body fat. Seven and a half, eight percent was the lowest I'd ever been in my life uh, until, until I was deciding that I was going to actually compete, right? So I was sub 6% body fat. This is, and here I am a year before I decide I'm going to get to com- uh, start competing. And actually, one of the things that blew me away that I, I just I couldn't figure it out at first was I was shredded. It was lean. It was 6% or less. Yet, I had this little tiny pooch still in my lower abdomen. Of body fat? Of body fat. Mm-hmm. And I and it just didn't make sense to me. Yet, I'm shredded, vascular everywhere else. But then, it just seems like I have this little bit of stubborn fat. Now, th- here's my theory. Uh, we talk about on the show a lot... Um, you know, every time why yo-yo dieting is so bad, every time you you lose body fat, then gain it back and then lose it and gain it back. You know, we talk about that the body actually can add fat cells. And we've also talked about how, you know, everybody has different stubborn areas on their body and areas that you tend to put the body fat uh, on first is always seems to be the last place that you lose it also. So that's for a lot of men and women, it can be that lower kind of pooch area. So what I realized was even when I got that lean, I still had this. Now I was training core and abs and doing a lot of things to, you know, draw it in. So when I actually hit stage the very first time, I still had this. Now you can't tell because I'm using the drawing. I'm drawing in, I'm keeping my abs contracted. So in photos and what everybody saw on stage, you can't really tell. But I knew, you know, I knew I still kind of had this little pooch thing, even though I was fucking shredded. And it wasn't until about the third show. So I had to get as shredded as I had ever been, then put on good lean mass, not put a bunch of body fat on, put good muscle on, speed the metabolism back up, then shred back down again, then do that. I had to do that about three times. It was about my third show before I actually completely eliminated that that low pooch. And again, like right now where I- What percentage I'm, were you at the third time? Uh, I was about 3%. So after my first show, I'd say my first show, well, no, I should say my first show, I came in about that lean. So yeah, I was leaner even on my very first show. So I'll, I'll, I'll put pictures up sometimes so people can see. I know you guys have seen them before where I have like my arm out straight like this. I had never been that straight. We, was, have, a, we have a poster in the, in the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, in my right. bedroom. I actually. mean, I was gaunt. Uh, that was the, the the first time, too, that I'd ever messed with uh, clenbuterol, and I thought it was so insane. My body was just like melting fat off of it and and muscle and it was like it was crazy how i felt and no I, discount code for that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah we don't sell that <laughs> no. uh, and i don't recommend it by any means yeah, it no, was no reputable companies uh, yeah it yeah. definitely was one of the scariest things that i ever messed with but it did get me leaner than i'd ever been in my life but yet still i still had that pooch so my point is that sometimes even when you get all the way down that you might still have these stubborn areas of body fat because of years and years and years of adding fat cells Mm -hmm. to your body and that it may not just come off the very first time that you get lean. You may have to get leaner than you've ever been before, you know, stay consistent still, dieting and training, build muscle, build the metabolism up, then come back down again to, to finally like get, cause it's, I, I think what makes it stubborn, it's stored energy, right? And if you're feeding your body, you have a body fat, other places, the body will, will well, get it wherever it's easiest. Fat cells can actually convert too. They can become uh, brown fat, which uh, is more likely to burn and produce heat for the body and other types of fat are much more stubborn. And doing the yo-yo dieting can, can reduce the amount of brown fat you have on your body. Your body becomes more resistant uh, to losing it and mm. back to competitors. Competitors that bulk the wrong way, that just put on a ton of body fat and go crazy, and then try and get lean again. Yes. You notice them each show. That's why it gets worse. unable to get. And this, yeah. th- th- that's why this is my theory. This is also why I think they struggle with that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think because each time they put on all that extra weight, they add more fat cells, which it just makes, makes it harder. Just makes it that much more difficult. Especially if they kind of have, they think they have figured their body out, and they have this like system, like oh, I cut this many calories, I eat these meals, I do this much cardio, I get this lean, and each time it gets more and more difficult. Now, for now them. what makes this especially frustrating though um if for moms who because i've had a few clients like this that were they worked out going into pregnancy 
They worked out during pregnancy. They had good nutrition. These are health, healthy people with good uh, fitness routines. Then they worked out after, and then they'd come to me and be like, what? This is so weird. I can't get – my midsection used to be so flat. I'm lean. I'm testing my body fat. What's going on? I don't necessarily have a lot of body fat there, but my lower midsection part seems to pooch out a little bit. Mm. And it was because their TVA mm -hmm. muscles weren't tight or strong. And then here's the flip of that, by the way. You can actually shrink your waist without getting any leaner by strengthening your TVA. I talked about the vacuum exercise. That's a direct exercise. But here's something else you can do. Every time you do an ab exercise or a oblique exercise, while you're doing the movement, let's say you're doing crunches, while you're doing the crunches, draw in your midsection, like you're trying to bring your belly button to your spine. Do that in combination with the ab exercise. It'll make it much more difficult, but what it does is it simultaneously tightens up the TVA and gives you a tighter, smaller waist. From a performance standpoint, TV mu TVA muscles extremely important. Strong TVA will strengthen your, your stability, your spine, prevent injury. And if you are an athlete, <laughs> You definitely want a strong TVA because it's going to make you more powerful. It's it's just going to make your you your more well, stiff and stable. And especially with moms and you know back pro like issues like like tightnesses and pains and whatnot, that's something that's going to help to address that and keep you in good posture. Which you know you're going to be very much front loaded all the time carrying uh, your kid around and doing everything right in front of you. So it's something to consider is really. Uh, to be able to maintain that and to draw in is still going to help support, uh, you, you know, the spine in that position where you're always like dude, kind of curling forward. Dude, you, you get someone who just had a baby and they're, they're cleared to exercise and you get them to try to do a vacuum and half the time they can't even activate the muscles. Yeah. Like they can't even draw in. It takes a lot of work. It does because those muscles had to turn off. So you need to, the, that is 100% should be a part of your routine. We have a, a in fact, we have a fit mom uh, bundle, which is a bundle of MAPS uh, programs that we put together specifically for moms or people who just had kids. And once you get cleared, so long as you're free of injury, the way you follow the bundle is it starts with MAPS Anywhere. It's a great program to start with. And there are drawing in maneuvers and exercises specifically designed to really strengthen the core. It's a great workout generally overall, great place to start. Um, and then it's got HIT in there, which is a great way to burn excess calories because a, a number one goal for for you know moms after birth, you know having we also a child. Have good is, YouTube videos, and there. there's great YouTube yeah. videos, and then there's Maps Anabolic in there for the metabolism. So if you're looking for like a like okay, I just want instruction and I want to follow something, and you get clearance to work out and you're free of injury, uh, take a look at the Fit Mom bundle that'll handle this and, and a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. Next question is from S Jordan three three nine three. You've talked about a study saying the average woman gains weight with an average intake of around 1,800 calories, but we technically need more to meet our nutrient needs. How do we combat this? Can we really eat more calories without gaining weight? I picked this question because I wanted to address uh, the annoying trainers that do this. And we haven't had someone do this in a while, but lately we've had a lot of trainers that like to go under our Q&A our qua questions and answer them. They're just trying to get followers. I know, and which I normally don't, I won't address until you, if you do try and say something that's mm. contradicting something that we're talking about to try and sound smart, which annoys me, right? They so I learned from a mastermind out there. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, in, in the, per, in the defense, technique. in the defense of the person that was doing this, uh, they're not wrong, you know, but this is what annoys me is when trainers do this, when they argue over semantics, when we, we lose the desired outcome of the conversation, Desired outcome of the conversation is to address exactly what this person is asking, is getting them to understand that the average female is already consuming a super low amount of calories, and it's important that they they think about increasing the caloric intake to speed up their metabolism instead of always going down lower and lower mm -hmm. in calories. In that, combination with resistance. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That was the point of me sharing that study and sharing that, that point. What I can't stand, and it reminds me of like when we talked about I forget what, uh, oh, when I would talk about 3,500 calories equals a pound of fat. 
okay, we know those uh, those are arbitrary numbers that it depends on it's, the... It it's de a rough estimation. It, exactly. Yeah. It's a very rough estimation, but I used to use that a lot to get the point across when trying to explain to a client what's going on when we're talking about mm. calories in versus calories yeah, out. Studies actually show it's 3,247. 3, yes. And that's what this, this kid did. He, come, he came yeah. underneath the question and he's... You know, challenging that statement, and and he's right. Okay, he, every person is is individually different. The body is is a resilient machine. If you eat low enough calories after a while, it will lower its its maintenance levels and what it needs nutrient wise, and then that will change the RDA. And there's an individual variance, and then there's movement ball. So it's fucking nuanced as shit. But you're a moron if you're a trainer and you're always trying to explain all those nuanced things to a client who doesn't understand any of that bullshit. And the desired outcome is to get the my female client to understand that, listen, you're only eating 15 to 1,800 calories. I don't want to take you down to 1,000 calories a day just because you want to lose 15 pounds. Mm -hmm. I want to start to slowly increase your caloric intake so that you get more calories. We speed your metabolism up. You get more nutrients. So- that was the reason why I yeah. picked this question was because I wanted to address that. Well, so okay, so back to the question. Um, and yes, you can speed up the metabolism. You do you do need to combine it with good resistance training though. Just bumping your calories uh, by itself will make you gain body fat. So you got to do a good resistance training program in order to do that. But back to the question: you have caloric needs, but you also have nutrient needs. Not macronutrient needs, but you have those Micro. too. But micronutrient needs as well. And so let's say you've got a slow metabolism. You're not burning a lot of calories because you're not active. You don't have a lot of muscle. You've dieted a lot in the past. And so now anything over 1,400 calories, you gain body fat. So you eat 1,400 calories a day. But it's really hard to get all the nutrients that your body needs, the micronutrients, with 1,400 calories because you get them in food. There's a couple ways you can handle this. Now, one way is the way that supplement companies love, which is – Take supp you know, supplement your nutrients without the calories. This was actually a selling point of the multivitamins that I was encouraged to sell when I was first a trainer. This is the pay the point they would make that people will cut their calories, but we need their nutrients high, so have them buy a multivitamin. Yes, technically that can help, um, but that's really a band aid. There's a better solution, which is to eat more nutrient dense foods. So eat foods that are high in micronutrients. Uh, meat is a good example. High quality meat, very Organ nutrient meat. dense. Mm -hmm. Organ meat, very nutrient dense. And then, of course, there's certain plants, uh, certain vegetables and fruits that are also very uh, high in, in key nutrients. Uh, dairy, very nutrient dense. So you could do that. Um, and, and the problem is when you eat low calories and the calories that you are eating are crappy, nutrient devoid, you know, foods like chips or processed foods. Um, that don't have a lot of micronutrients and you're just getting a bunch of calories. And what ends up happening, this is one theory, is that your calories are a certain amount, but your nutrients are so low and it just stimulates more appetite because your body's like, okay, we need more vitamin D or we need more K or we need more net magnesium. Uh, so I'm just going to make you hungry so you can go eat more food because we got to search for this nutrient. There's a theory around that and I tend to believe that there's some that some of that is, is true. I'll be even more prescriptive with this. Like so, something that I would do with a client of mine. Um, you brought up the Fit Mom bundle. This is where I would use like the RGB bundle, right? So, you know, you have Maps Anabolic Performance and Aesthetic, which is basically uh, nine plus months worth of training, and within that, you're going to go through ten different phases. So, what I do with someone who's in this situation is I take them through that entire bundle. And at every phase, I have them increase their calories by 100 to 200 calories a day. So if this person is currently at 16 or 1700 calories in phase one, we try and bump one to 200 calories. Then phase two, we bump another 100 to 200 calories. Then phase three, another 100. To, and I keep doing that all the way through the bundle. And the, the theory behind that or why that I've had so much success is every one of the, the phases as they go through all these programs is a new novel stimulus, which sends a signal to the body that it needs to adapt and build more muscle, which will then support the additional calories that you're intaking. And if we do it just right by adding 150 to 200 or so calories every time, most of those calories will get allocated over to building muscle versus getting stored as body fat. Then by the end 
okay, of this where you figure you're talking about a, you know, I said 10 phases. It's like nine months. Yeah, you're, you're talking about this person could potentially increase their calories to 26, 2700 calories. I had, I had a, a client that I did exactly that and I was able to get her metabolism up by 850 calories a day. Like that's huge. Do you know how much cardio you have to do to burn 850 calories, like yeah. two hours yeah. of cardio? And it was over the course of, I think it took us about seven or eight months Got her calories uh, up to up 850 without gaining body fat. She obviously had a little bit more muscle and strength on her body. Then it was really easy to cut her calories to get her lean. This is what she ended up with. She ended up eating more than she did when she started to lose body fat. How great is that, right? So that's the that's the whole that's the premise. Ideal. That's the whole premise behind it. But yeah, when it comes to nutrients, the more food you eat. Uh, the more potential nutrients you can consume, but it ma the food matters a lot. Like one ounce of, of liver, which is an organ meat that's extremely uh, nutrient dense, is going to give you way more nutrients than ten pounds of you know uh, potato chips or something like that. Like it's going to get that's how nutrient dense it is. So nutrient density is important in your food, unless you want to supplement all the time, which. There's nothing necessarily wrong with supplementing, but it is a cheap Band-Aid. Getting your nutrients from food is always the best. It's, your body assimilates it the best. It contains cofactors that enhance absorption. You get lots of other beneficial things that are in the food. It's just a better way to get your, your nutrients up. Next question is from Jordan Lacey. Should I be manipulating my macros every time I phase into a new workout regimen every four to six weeks? I mean... Maybe. Uh, yeah, I you think, can. I mean, you definitely can. I, I like to, I personally like to match my dietary changes with workout changes personally. It's just, it makes most sense to me from a psychological standpoint. Mm. Uh, I do this with clients. I do this with myself. Um, studies show pretty consistently, and I've experienced this uh, time and time again with clients, that when somebody starts working out, they tend to naturally want to change their nutrition anyway. So mm -hmm. you, you get this with clients all the time. Like you get a client, they're like, I want to do all these changes. And you say, okay, don't change your diet. Just let me train you for a little while so we can get you stronger and then we'll tackle that later. And they end up naturally, I think because they are because they know they're working out, they naturally start to change things a little bit. So pairing them together, in my experience, it's, it's better. Uh, it seems to be effective. And so I do that with myself. Uh, I think you learn this over time. You know, the, you kind of experiment and you see what your body does best with in terms of, you know, when you're in an intense workout, uh, you know, I found I do need a bit of carbs. I need to up that a bit. I need that immediate energy access. It, it definitely helps me through uh, performance wise. And so I'm kind of like evaluating that versus if I'm more of a, in a restorative mode where I'm going to go a little bit higher in the fats and, you know, less in the carbs and up my protein. And so there's just ways to manipulate uh, based on where you're at and what your current goals are. And you just kind of weave in and out of that. You definitely have to do the work of finding out first, like what foods uh, work with you best and, you know, what your energy levels are and track all that. But be careful not to overthink this, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you know, I agree with both the guys. You absolutely can change it. I do like to manipulate it based off phases, similar to what Sal's saying. Justin brings up a great point. You start to figure out like, oh, a higher carb diet does better when I have like a higher intensity type of training. You know, all those things you learn over time. But also be careful of if you find something that is working really well with you. So diet is a little bit different, right? Even though I do believe that our body adapts to nutrition very similar as it adapts to anything else. So I'm sure there are some benefits to rotating and changing things out. But if you have found like a really good balance as far as this, this satiates me, it keeps me away from craving bad foods, I have energy when I work out, I sleep well, my gut feels healthy. If you've got that and, and it's all working for you, um, I wouldn't tell somebody just because we're moving into a new phase, like, hey, let's change it all up now. Let's, you know, let's increase your fats or let's, you know, decrease carbs for a little while if it's working really well for you. If all of those things are aligned and you're doing really well, why would you go do something completely different that may, you know, spike up the carbohydrate or spike up the cravings or, you know, start to interrupt sleep or start to lose some energy during your workout? So if if the diet or whatever your or plan or macro breakdown you're following is working really well for you, then I, I wouldn't mess too much with it, especially if you're seeing great results. Now, if you're not, 
you know, and you haven't hit that sweet spot or you see things like you notice, like, for example, bringing up the whole satiate thing. Sometimes I'll have a client like, oh, love the diet, Adam, it's going good, but man, around this time, I get hungry and I'm craving this and I'm doing that. So I might tell a client, okay, let's do this. Let's bump your fats a little bit or let's bump your protein. I'll, I'll give them a macronutrient that I know is more satiating to help curb some of the, the the cravings that they're having. So instead of like reinventing the entire macro breakdown, you know, pay attention to those little subtle things or like to Justin's point, not having energy. Like let's say clients training with me and they're like, man, Adam, I feel really good. You know, I'm sleeping well, all, all is well. But then when I go to our workout, sometimes I just... I feel like halfway through, I just lose energy or I'm dragging to get there. Okay, well, I might bump their carbohydrates, you know, before they come to see me to kind of help combat that. So, you know, I, I would recommend th more like that, like start to assess, you know, what you're noticing between sleep, energy, gut, all these things, and then uh, manipulate macros to try and uh, help those things out versus, oh, it's week six. I've been following this 60, 20, 20 breakdown and everything's going great, but I, you know, I heard on Mind Pump I should change it up, you know. Mm -hmm. So you change, like, no, I, I wouldn't recommend that. Next question is from Coach Carruthers. Stuart McGill has talked about breathing mechanics being an important step indicator of back health. How would you incorporate breathing into training? Breathing is uh, extremely important. If you don't breathe, you die. No, uh, yeah. all joking aside. Well, this is to your point that you were just making up about your TVA. Uh, yes. Right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, the transverse abdominis is, and part of that is the diaphragm and like, what is it, 28 other muscles that surround the spine mm -hmm. and support that. And so your ability to control the, your breathing and to draw that in is is your internal weight belt. Yeah. yeah. Your, your, how you breathe is very important when you are exerting maximal force, especially Especially. So like Olympic weightlifters, for example, practice something called the Vasalva mm -hmm. maneuver. This is actually an important part of them generating power. And essentially what it is is they breathe in deep. They get a full diaphragmatic breath down into their belly. Then they hold that breath and they brace everything around that air in their lungs and in their uh, in, with, the, with the, their diaphragm. And that produces a lot of stability. So proper breathing with heavy lifting is is definitely important to stabilize and strengthen the spine. As far as regular lifting is concerned, you know, I think when people overthink this, sometimes you get problems yes. because it's like, you know, if, if I'm training a client and I'm having them think about form and technique and watch your hips and look at your knees and make sure your feet are th doing this and have good posture, and then I throw into it, all right, I want you to breathe out here, breathe in here, do all... It's like, oh my God. Yeah, I got to think about breathing now, and now I don't know what the hell's going on. So, usually when clients would ask me, what about breathing? I would say, just breathe normally. Yeah. You know, just breathe normally and you're fine. I experienced the same thing. Cause, and here's the thing with trainers like, we go to a lot of these, uh, you know, certifications and we learn these new techniques and modalities. It gets us all excited and we want to apply it to our clients. Like, uh, you know, and, and that's something I had to learn too, because, uh, we had Wim Hof here and I went through the course and, and was really excited about, you know, hyperoxygenation and like, let's, let's work on these types of short breaths and get our body, get our lung capacity up and, you know, do diaphragmatic breathing. And, uh, you know, here's how I can weave this into the training session. And, you know, and it has its place for, uh, in terms of calming the body down, calming the system down, like de-stressing and, uh, lots of benefits to it. And there's no doubt that, you know, it works, but, uh, you know, trying to weave that into now, uh, the training session, the exercises, it really convoluted everything, it made everything really complicated and the clients would get really frustrated. And we, and, and so you just got to consider like how much you, you really need to be conscious of and let the unconscious okay. kind of take over. What I would do with, with clients, and then you could try this yourself. When I would focus on breathing, that's all we were doing. I didn't combine it with exactly. lots of movement. Yes. So one way you can practice full diaphragmatic breath is to lay on your back on the floor. You place one hand on your chest, one hand on, right on your belly button, and then take a deep breath. And what you want to do is you want the hand that's on the belly button to rise first and rise fully before the chest, the hand on the chest moves. If you don't breathe this way, it's going to feel weird. And most of us don't. Most of us breathe into our chest. So when you take a deep breath, it all goes into the chest and the hand on the belly button doesn't move much. So what you do is you got to slow down, focus on fully using your diaphragm, making the hand on the belly move first and fully before the chest uh, hand does. And what you'll find through this full diaphragmatic breath is it causes you to really chill and relax. And in fact, I actually have had this happen 
at least five times where I'll take a client super stressed out, everything's going crazy or whatever, mm-hmm. and I'll say, okay, we're going to spend 10 minutes on diaphragmatic breathing. And I would take them into a, a room, kind of dark. They lay on the floor. I do this practice with them. And at least five times I had clients start crying. Yeah. And it, it literally, they would sit it's there. really weird. I've had the same thing. Same thing? Yeah. All of a sudden, they start crying, and and and, and it, the reason why I think they started crying is because they allowed their body to relax, process whatever stress or feelings they were having, mm-hmm. and it just came out in emotion, and it was always kind of interesting and strange, and then they felt better, yeah. and then we work out. But it's a great practice. I recommend diaphragmatic yeah. breathing uh, before sleep. I think people. I think too, like the real value of it is when you get a new client and you're going through the assessment process, you're trying to really teach them uh, how to uh, you know understand their body even further and you're going through posture you're going through all these types of assessments but this is one of those things like too if they can learn that you know from the very beginning they get an understanding of when to apply that when they're overstressed and you know all these things so it's like a it's a great teaching uh tool and it's something that's very valuable but you got to learn when and and how to use it i found it extremely valuable to do it when you just like what you said justin during like my assessment or the first week i was training a client doing things like you know, box breathing or the draw on maneuver and getting them to understand how to activate, draw on their TVA and, and tighten their core up. Once you've done a good job, like I remember I had clients, each one's going to be different, right? But the ones that were really good, I could be in the middle of working out and I could say, activate your core. I could tell them that because I already did the training yeah. early on. Yeah. And so I could incorporate it into training once you do that. So if you do it at the very beginning to get them to understand what it is you're asking them to do when you say draw in or activate your TVA and they're like, oh, okay, you do that draw and maneuver type of exercise. They get it. They get the concept now. They understand why you're having them do that to support the spine. Then when you're doing a bent over row or a seated row or you're doing an extra, getting ready to squat and you say, yeah, before we go into the squat, you know, activate that core, they'll know what you mean because you've done the, you've done the prerequisites. And then the other place I think I probably use it the most is and I think Sal, you just said this right with the with, at nighttime, right? Mm. Getting them to calm down. So and and maybe that's because it that's where it's added the most value for me. Like so, I've mentioned on the show before that um, I have a really hard time settling my thoughts down uh, at nighttime. And one of the things, and I remember this was after Justin went through Wim Hof, and we were we were a lot of discussion was around breathing. Uh, I noticed that uh, at nighttime when my my brain was going 100 miles an hour, I also noticed I was having these like short, like Mm -hmm. you, I wasn't aware of it because I was so into my thoughts, but I realized that the way I was kind of breathing was not normal and slow and controlled. And that's when I taught Katrina how to box breathe and we would box breathe together. And then still to this day, you know, she has this crazy weird ability to be able to tell when I'm thinking, even when it's silent in the room. And all of a sudden, she'll kind of elbow me and be like, let's breathe together. And then we'll do like five to 10 breaths. And then I can literally feel my heart rate like completely mm-hmm. settle down. And then I can get into my get into my sleep. Otherwise, I'll be racing all night. Yeah, you know who naturally uh, belly breathes or breathes, watch little kids? Little kids don't, they haven't learned yet the chest breathing, the whatever. And you'll watch them play and run around. And when they stop, you'll see them fully breathe into their belly Big belly out yeah in, you know yeah whereas when we are you know we're all stressed out we're like oh, all in our chest yeah, we're Bre- always trying to keep it in yeah breathing's really important it's also a pattern just like any muscle muscle recruitment pattern if you get stuck in a pattern you can get stuck breathing only one particular way and some forms of breathing are great for helping you in a stressful situation and others are great for helping your body relax and if you get stuck in one and it's typically the stressed out breathing You are literally sending a signal to your body that says you're stressed. Even if you're not, just by breathing that way, your body thinks. Haven't they connected that to anxiety? Absolutely. Yeah, they've Mm -hmm. connected. I mean, a lot of people that are really, really anxious, uh, this is like one of the best things you do. So if you have a client, so there's this is, and this this is what makes good trainers, right? This is where you uh, adjust programming. Client comes in, Adam, I want to lose 30 pounds. I want to, that's like the main, that's all the thing they're telling you about. You're going through training. Then you find out like this person is just completely. You know, drowning in anxiety all the time, like, and then now a whole workout routine could be all about that. Totally, because and and that could be life changing for that person to get them to understand that hey, when you have these moments mm. of anxiousness and feeling anxiety, stop what the fuck you're doing and do these exercises I'm teaching you right now. It could be life changing for someone. So it's a 
a, an example of where this now would uh, t- completely supersede whatever program I had going on because that's such a big deal yeah. in their Gotta life. Bring your body back to homeostasis first. Totally. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video and audio. So if you want to watch us and not just listen to us, go to YouTube. Also, in this episode, we mentioned a couple bundles. Bundles are where we combine multiple maps, programs for specific goals. I talked about the Fit Mom Bundle. Uh, Adam mentioned the RGB Bundle. You can find both of those bundles at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Go check those out. Also, uh, if you want to find us on social media, you can find all of us on Instagram. Doug could be found at Mind Pump. before we leave. Doug's at Mind Pump Doug. Uh, Justin's at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. Yeah, here's a here's a simple sta- uh, stability exercise. You, you take your shoes and socks off, so you're barefoot, and stand in front of a mirror, and then balance on one foot and pay attention to what happens to your leg. Is your foot collapsing? Is it turning out, or is it facing straight? Is your your knee turning in a little bit or turning out a little bit?